This is Pete Fornitale back with you on the Sunday show with my special guest this morning, someone that I have been waiting to meet for 25 years. And I've been out there 15 minutes. This is getting <laughs> <laughs> Harry Nielsen, welcome to the Sunday show. Thank you and good morning. Can't tell you how much I've been looking forward to this. Thank you, me too. First of all, we you can... Said, you said sincerely. <laughs> <laughs> we can claim you as one of our own, right? Bro well, I'm from New York. I'm from Brooklyn. Brooklyn, New yeah. York. And you were here long enough to have uh, have scars. memories, <laughs> not memories, but scars. Yeah, right. What do you recall about your days in our town? I mentioned to you actually when we were off the air, uh, the two brightest moments were when I saw the guy shot in the neck with the zip gun Ooh. when I was about nine, almost ten, and then uh, after that, my mother and sister and I were beaten up by a, a gang of uh, black girls, a youth gang. In Brooklyn. And uh, the next uh, spring, we left town. That could sour you, I suppose. Well, it was just such a strange thing to happen. <laughs> you went west at that point, yes? Yeah. Uh, yeah. What period are we to, talking uh, about? To Rockland. No, <laughs> no. Uh, in the 50s, early 50s. Early 50s. California. To California. And then moved to East L.A. Great improvement. <laughs> uh, then uh, found a radio, you know. Is that what beat did up, it? Found a beat up old radio, and they they had this guy named Johnny Magnus. He used to say, uh, "This is Johnny Magnus uh, coming at you from 1065 Dolphin Avenue, Dolphin Avenue, Dolphin, Dolphin, and something Dolphin." Well, we have stacks and stacks and racks and racks of records more for your enjoyment here at Dolphin Store, you know. <laughs> and, and every night I used to play Ray Charles and uh, just great old music, you know. I just kept that record the radio next to the bed and you know that was the that was the bible you know and that's what got you into it that's what made you want to do it i think so yeah yeah how did you go about making that transition well that took years uh i have my best friend uh at the time he, he killed himself last year but he's we were like the poor man's everly brothers and so we used to we had an old tape recorder and we used to sing uh, everly type tunes then we found out we were making up lyrics so then we started adding changing melodies so we found out oh that's oh now we're writing tunes you know mm -hmm. and that went on for several years and um, high school or yeah that period yeah now i remember as i said earlier my first introduction to you came in 1967 with the release of pandemonium shadow show on, yeah uh, on rca victor records and uh, there's a lot of wonderful stuff on here. Thank you. Does it hold up for you? Do you? Uh... I haven't listened to it in a long time. How did you get to make this record? I remember reading stories at the time that you were in computers or banking. Yeah, I worked at a bank in a computer center for seven years while other guys were out there, uh, you know, playing the clubs and everything. And uh, uh, I used to stay up all night and wash the windows at this place. They used to give me a key and I could use the piano, the tape recorder, and this couch. And in the daytime, I'd go hustle tunes at record companies and say, well, if you don't like the tune, maybe you'll like me. And one day, I I played this uh, song for Rick Gerard for the... I think it was the Airplane or uh, Jose Feliciano. And he says, stay right here for a minute. And he went down the hall and he came back and he said, well, the, 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 the director said, we already have a singer-songwriter on the label. And I said, oh, that's too bad. Who is it? And he said, uh, Rod McEwen. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> so I said, well, geez, I don't, I don't see the similarity that much. I, you know. He says, well, hold on. He, he kept running back and forth. And finally he came through. He says, uh, they, they're, they're going to let me sign you. So they gave him this very low contract and when it came time to re-sign I said no I won't take anything and it came time to re-sign again and by that time I had a hit so I said no I won't no thank you and I waited till I had a big hit I waited till I had about three hits and then finally we started talking money and then finally I made the big contract with RCA with uh, John Lennon we went in and said John said to the guy look you've only ever had two artists on the whole label Elvis and Harry you know, give, give them the $2, I'll sign with you. you oh, know? that's an And eerie that's what got impressive. me. The, yeah, that's, well, that's, <laughs> that's what got me the contract. Uh, you, you mentioned hits. Do you mean 
covers by other? No, uh, well, like everybody's talking and. Uh, ah, okay, but this 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 had already been out. This uh, this one, yeah. 67. Now this one, yeah. There were a lot of cover records on this one. Uh, yeah. Without you was covered by a lot of people. Jeff Beck did Ten Little Indians. Uh, George Burns did 1941. The Monkees did Cuddly Toy. Uh, you can't do that. We got a lot of airplay. A lot of jazz people did Sleep Late, My Lady Friend, She's Leaving Home is a classic uh, something. Um, without her, as I mentioned, got a lot of play. What was the big break? When did you feel? Well, the, uh, right after that, uh, I walked into the same producer's office, and I was looking at a pile of records, and, and I said, what's this? And he says, oh, I'm looking for a song for a group called Stone Country, and it was the song was Everybody's Talking. So I said, you know, I could do that. And he said, yeah. You know, so he said, okay. So we went down to the studios, I think, that day and uh, recorded it. And uh, when we finished the take, it was time to go to lunch. And he says, just be careful crossing the street. I think we got one, you know. Wow. So it was a hit. And then, not a, not a number one, but it was a big hit. And uh, a producer in London heard it, uh, the man who was producing Midnight Cowboy, Jerry Hellman, and he got a hold of me and asked if I would write a song for Midnight Cowboy. He had already asked Dylan and Joni Mitchell, and the three of us had written songs for it, and he rejected all three. Uh, jo I forget what Joni wrote, but it was a hit. Dylan wrote a hit. He wrote Lay, Lady Lay for it, and it was a hit. I wrote I Guess the Lord Must Be in New York City, which is a hit. Had they used any of the three, they would have gotten a, they would have had another Oscar <laughs> under their belts. <laughs> but who knew, yeah. So they ultimately settled, if that's the right word, on uh, everybody's talking for the film. Did you have mixed emotions about it? Well, yeah, I was hoping they would use my song, but it was eligible in one category in the Grammys, and that was song um, sung for a motion picture or something. So they entered in the Grammys, and I won the Grammy for it, so that was nice, you know. Yeah. I don't think you've ever conducted your career in the conventional manner. There were no Harry Nielsen concert tours, for example, or, or even, uh, even promotional appearances, concerts that I'm, a, that I'm aware of. No, you're right. What was the thinking behind that, Harry? What well, there wasn't, there wasn't much thinking behind it. It was... Um, when the Beatles announced the formation of Apple, they had this amazing press conference in New York. Somebody said it was the second largest press conference since the end of World War II. <laughs> I remember that well. May of 1968. Is that what it was? Yeah, yeah. And at it, someone said, someone asked, uh, who's your favorite American singer? And John said, uh, Nilsson. And someone else asked Paul, who's your favorite American group? And he says, Hi, uh, Nilsson. You know? <laughs> so all of a sudden, the phones started ringing off the hook in L.A. And I, did you hear what they just said? Did you hear what they just said? They just said you're their favorite. I said, who? You know? And he said, the Beatles just said you're their favorite. I said, oh, go on. He said, no, no, I've got it on tape. I'll send you the tape. Don't lose it, you know? So next thing that the phone started ringing, where are you playing? I said, well, I'm not. I just left the bank two weeks before, you know. I said, well, I'm not, actually. They said, well, where did you, where did you last play, or where are you playing next? I said, well, I haven't. I'm not, you know. They said, well, the man who doesn't appear. And I thought, oh, that's pretty hip. Maybe I can, <laughs> yeah, the lazy way out, you know. It's sort of mysterioso, <laughs> the man who never appeared. And so people would call and say, where is he appearing? Was I? And they said, he's not, you know. And then it just became this sort of legendary, he doesn't appear, you know. So it wasn't much thought given to it. I just liked the idea, you know, sitting back, making music in the studio and not having to go on the road because all the stories I heard were nightmares, you know. Uh, we have to trace that uh, Beatle relationship a bit further, but before we do, I want to ask you about a very ambitious project that you undertook at this time which was a network animated special. Yeah. I thought it was Orson Welles for a minute. <laughs> Tell me about it. <laughs> well, it's just an idea I had one night. I, was, I think it was on some kind of weirdness, and uh, I, rec I realized that uh, everything seemed to have a point, a physical point, you know, the trees and the leaves and the bushes and so forth, and then it also had a philosophical point, if you know what I mean. And I thought, well, what if there were a place where everyone had a point 
and it was born to that place of a boy who didn't have one, you know, and he was banished to the, let's say, the pointless forest. Mm -hmm. And he went to the pointless forest, and he realized that everything in the pointless forest had a point too. Um, the leaves all had points, the trees, it said. And uh, he meets the rock man, the leaf man, and so forth, and they each give him a point of view. And armed with these different points of view, he goes back to the land of point and confronts the evil count and says, we went to the pointed, pointless forest and it's not pointed at all. In fact, uh, this was pointed and that was pointed. And, and he says, what? And he says, yeah, and we figured if everything in the pointless forest has a point and everything in the land of point has a point, then we must have one too, or I must have one too. <laughs> and someone from the crowd yells out, he's got a point there. And at that point, you know, he grows a point and they lose theirs, you know. Isn't the best known song from that uh, Me and My Arrow? Yeah, which later became a Plymouth ad, caught, was more famous. Right. Me and My Arrow put a whole car company out of business. <laughs> <laughs> Another project that you were involved in at this time was another album that came out of nowhere, Nielsen Sings Newman, as in Randy Newman, at a time when I don't think many people knew who Randy Newman was. No, he did. <laughs> <laughs> Yet here was a whole album of his wonderful songs. Well, I heard his wonderful demos, and I thought, well, geez, this guy's writing better than me, and I, I'm not writing much. And I, so I called him and said, look, uh, what if we do an album like they used to in the old days, you know, a guy does an album of someone else's songs, like a courtesy or something. And so uh, I said, you know, you just play the piano and I'll sing. And I'll put a lot of voices on it. So I ended up, I think, putting a hundred voices on it all together. And he played the piano and I put a few sound effects here and there. And that was the album. And it won the uh, Stereo Review Album of the Year, uh, Producer of the Year. What's your favorite uh, Randy Newman song? Oh, I, I don't know. I don't want to make judgments on his tunes. I, I like them all. How about... Well, almost all. Is there one from the album that uh, oh, stands album, out for you? See. Take a look. Yeah. Take a look. Um, see, I'm confused with you now which one I like because of my performance or which is the better song. But well... I'll Be Home stands out. Vine Street stands out. Yellow Man, I think. Because I just I like it, and that was this I think his newest song at the time. Yellow Man from mm -hmm. uh, Nielsen sings Newman. At ninety two three K Rock, this is Pete Fornatel back with you on the Sunday show with my special guest Harry Nielsen. This is his first time visit to the show, so we're trying to cram as much in as we possibly can, and I guess we had just reached that point uh, in the early seventies when your career went to another level. I guess that would be with the uh, with the Nielsen Schmielsen album. Do you agree? Yeah. Uh, actually, this is a pre-question to that. W were you a reluctant star, Harry? Were there... Uh, I guess you might say that. I mean, I, you know, I turned down the fan clubs and didn't do interviews and things. You know, I guess, yeah, yeah. Can you remember what it was? I sort of played with my career rather than take it very seriously. You know, I think that was a mistake, I think. but You'd do it differently now? I think I would. Although, on the other hand, I'm looking forward to signing a record deal and going out and doing PAs, which I've never done. So I've got a whole thing to look forward to, you know. Is there a... Um it, was there a model? Was there someone that you were patterning yourself? Nothing like that. Not a fan. Uh, and Laurel and Hardy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I mean, you see what I'm saying here? Very unconventional. Someone who doesn't perform. Someone who doesn't play the uh, game, so to speak. And yet, in spite of that, has enormous successes. And and maybe none so enormous as as when uh, Nielsen Schmielsen came out. How did that impact on your life? Well, that was a worldwide number one. It was a big record. And I always sort of missed the success of the records because I would be in England and when it was a hit in America and I was in New York when it was a hit in London. And But that one you couldn't miss because there were three or four hits from it. Tell me everything there is to know about Without You. 
without you. I was at a party one night in Laurel Canyon, and uh, uh, you know, I was sitting on the floor playing records, and somebody played this song, and I I thought it was Lennon. Without you, you know, I, th I thought that little thing. I said, next day, I called my friend. And I said, "What was that? That that song that had you know you, you know, in it? You know?" He says, "What?" I said, "You know, it's like a Beatles song. It's like a Lennon thing." He says, Jesus, "I know which one you mean, but I can't think of it." And everyone remembered that, but no one remembered the song. And we're all going through all the Beatles collections. And I said, "I know. It's not the Beatles. It's the other one, Group Grapefruit." You know. And, it's not them. And finally, somebody said, uh, Badfinger. I said, Bad? Oh, that's it. And we found Without You. So I took it to Richard Perry, the producer, and said, Hey, Richard, I think I found one. <laughs> he said, Oh, Harry, I think you have. So you weren't surprised that it was as big as it was? Mm, not really. No, not really, because it seemed to hit all the commercial bases, you know? Explain that. T tell me what you mean. It, well, I don't know. It just it satisfied the need for ra radio's need or something, you know. At that moment. At that moment, yeah. Yeah. It was all well put together, well, and you know, um, uh, it was just a good record. When it uh, became number one, was that a special moment for you? Yeah, I, yeah, because of, there were like billboards all over the place with my picture on them, uh, pregnant, saying Harry's a mother, you know, <laughs> this biggest <laughs> billboard in Manhattan, you know, it was a big picture, and I was in Time magazine, and you know, it was uh, a lot of uh, things, and it's funny, I, I'd, I'd go by a news rack, and I'd see a whole bunch of Time magazines, you know, I'd, and there's me, you know. I just buy a Time magazine from the guy who never looked up, and I, I felt like saying, "Hey, that's me," you know, <laughs> or stop somebody and say, "Look, look up, look, look, that's me." But there was never anybody to show it to. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's very funny. Well, and it certainly propelled the album and the uh, the music that immediately followed this record. Son of Schmilson, yeah, yeah, which uh, unfortunately, it didn't do quite as well because it had some controversial material on it. Should we talk about that? Sure. I mean, I have to tell you, I was in radio at the time, and here comes this new album from Harry Nielsen, <laughs> and I put it on my <laughs> turntable. You can tell how long ago this was. And there's, uh, you're breaking my heart, you're tearing it apart. Etc. And well, what's the etc.? <laughs> <laughs> now I fell on the floor laughing, and I, was that was that your in, the intended yes. re reaction to it? <laughs> yeah. What what made you do that? Well, it's because we use it in our everyday language. Everybody knows the word. It's hypocrisy at its greatest, uh, and it's such a great way to send it up. You know, you're breaking my heart. So. F you, you know? <laughs> <laughs> You're going to put the what engineers you, to work and, overtime on this and, one. And what do you say? You're breaking my heart, darn it. I mean, you know. <laughs> I told you what my favorite is. No, I, oh, joy? Joy. Yeah. Do you remember the line? Can you? Yeah. Sure. Um, which line? <laughs> well, the, the uh, well, let me hear. Fortunately, we have the... The other uh, day, I met a girl named Joy. And she said, Roy, come here. I'm going to make you my joy, boy. Well, things went good and things went bad. Now every time I think of joy, I get all clammy inside <laughs> or something. And the chorus, the chorus. Joy to the world was a beautiful girl, but to me, joy meant only sorrow. We have skipped over a uh, media footnote that Harry Nielsen was involved <laughs> in that I would be... Um, remiss if I did not bring up in the, in this program. We talked about your work for films. How about your work for television? Not only the point, mm. but the theme song for a fondly remembered 70s, late 60s, early 70s sitcom called The Courtship of Eddie's Father. How did you get involved? How did you get involved in that? Well, uh, the producer got a hold of me and uh, I was on MGM lot working on a movie, and the producer said, are you Harry Nielsen? I said, yeah. And he says, I've been looking all over town for you, and you're on this lot? And I said, yes. I didn't. I thought he was going to hit me. I didn't know. 
He says, my wife said, we came out of a hotel and there's a billboard over there. And she says, that's the guy you want to do your music? You know? <laughs> so, and I recognized the guy's face. He was the guy who sang, you gotta have heart in Damn Yankees. Is the song called My Best Friend, by the way? Best Friend. Best Friend? Yeah. Uh, what did he say? This is what the show's about, write me a song, or yeah. look at an episode, write me a song? He showed me an episode, and he said, this is what the show's about. <laughs> he, says, you know, he says, they're more than dad and lad. They're like friends, you know. I said, well, okay. People let me tell you about my best friend, you know. He's a one heart, what is it? One boy, cuddly, tore him up, my down, my pride and joy. Pride and joy, you know. Well, that one. Whether, uh, you're, whether you're talking man to man or whether you're talking son to son. Pete Fornatel back with you on the Sunday show with my special guest this morning, Harry Nielsen. We're kind of doing a uh, condensed version of This Is Your Life or yeah, something like that. I feel like, like I'm in a Fellini thing. <laughs> Are these mostly happy memories for you, Harry? Or, or, well, sure. Or not so happy? Uh, that, that, the last 20 years flew by because, I mean, you, you can't not have a good time. When you're making a lot of money, you have some success, you have a beautiful wife and six kids, you know. Was there not a downside to all of this, though? Well, a lot of people got shot and killed and, you know. Well, in in a strange way, I'm going to pick up the the Beatle thread that we were talking about earlier because they certainly injected your career, uh, gave it that boost that we were talking about earlier. At what point did you uh, did you meet up with them? Well, right after the Apple conference, I got a call from John. You know, he says, uh, "Is this Harry?" Yeah, this is John. Listen, man, you're fantastic. I just wanted to say you're great. You know, <laughs> who's this? It's like four in the morning. And he says, "John Lennon." You know, and I said, "Wow, you're not so bad yourself." You know, and just sort of joking. He says, "Ah, oh, that's great." You know, you have to come over and we'll do something or something, huh? You know. The next morning, uh, the next Monday, rather, Paul called, and it was, uh, little Harold, this is Paul, you know. (laughs) Gotta be a thrill. And it was, uh, oh, it was great, because the next morning I get up, put on a suit, took a shower, we we waited at four o'clock, no Ringo, you know, (laughs) never, never, never called. Uh, Now, you know, are you saying to yourself, you know, hey, I'm Harry from the bank. Yeah. What's happening here? Yeah, I was. Yeah, a lot. How do you deal with it? How do you? <laughs> I used to laugh a lot inside. You know, <laughs> people would say congratulations. I'd say thank you, and they'd start asking for autographs. And people would say, I know you'd always make it, and then you earned. It. And people, aren't you the guy who did? And I say thanks a lot. And and then I'd just sit there and sort of laugh inside. I'd be in a bar, and somebody would say something. What do you do? And what do you do? And and inside of saying, Jesus, it's just me here, and uh, I'm being associated with them there, you know, yeah. the fifth former blonde Beck ex Beatle from the USA, you know. <laughs> so that was always a lot of fun, you know. When did you start working with the uh, guys after the breakup, I take well, it? Well, uh, yeah. I was at the, uh, uh, the White Album, uh, the uh, Little Piggy session, but I didn't work on it. Uh, George was doing his thing. And then uh, uh, George played on my song, You're Breaking My Heart, the uh, fabulous... Uh, yes. But, but you. you know. <laughs> and then that was the first. And then uh, I think John or... R- no, Ringo played next. And uh, then I played on Ringo's. And then John and I got together. I played on a lot of Ringo's. And then John and I got together and we made an album. And Ultimately, he ended up producing you. Yeah. And then uh, one of us, we wrote three or four songs together, one of which you have here, which I, well, we didn't write this, but it's a surprise. I mean, this was yeah. handed, this is handed to me by a guy who said, here, I think you'll get a kick out of this. And I had no idea this tape existed. And you can just play it if you have it up. You know? when, when was it done, Harry? Can you even place it in time? It was done. Uh, well, you'll know. All right. Well, no, no. Why don't we give it a listen on the Sunday show at 92.3 K-Rock? That gets a big wow from me. Wow. wow. <laughs> <laughs> it's like hearing him again, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, but now that's, you know... <coughs> Tape, <but>, please. <laughs> <laughs> you want that one back? Yeah. <laughs> um, now, that is the same arrangement and even yeah. the same track yeah. that Ringo's version yeah. ultimately came out, but it's you and John Lennon. Yeah. What happened was... Uh, 
I was in L.A. when they were cutting the basic tracks, and then I had to go to New York for a day or two, and John did a guide vocal for Ringo, and I didn't know about that, but sometimes he used to do that, you know. And uh, when I got back, I was unaware of that. I ran in the studio because I was a little late, and they said, okay, what, what, where am I? You know, and they said, well, here's the tune, and here's Ringo, and they're giving me a balance, you know, and I'm listening to Ringo singing. So I sang my bits, you know, and they never bothered to play me what John did, so I never heard it. And then all these years later, here's somebody hands me a ghost, you know, a present. I went, whoa. Can you mind, imagine what that did to me? I'll bet you're glad <laughs> to have that in your oh, possession. Oh, it blew my mind. You had done, I think it's course, a hit, by the way. It sounds great. It just sounds great. Jeez, that, that reminds me of a subject that we completely skipped over, which is the fact that, you know, nowadays everybody gets so excited when a Natalie Cole does an album of standards or a Linda Ronstadt does an album of standards. You did that back in 1973. Mm -hmm. A little bit, a little touch <laughs> of Schmielsen in the night. Yes, yeah, from Shakespeare, Henry V, uh, before the Battle of Agincourt, when the soldier looks at the other one and he, he doesn't know... He doesn't know Big Hank's in the trench. And he says, oh, for a little touch of Harry in the night. <laughs> what possessed you to do that record, Harry? I, I figured my voice was probably at its purest and best at that moment. And I thought, even though I was smoking and drinking and doing all the nastiness, I figured this is the time to really capture my voice on tape. So Derek Taylor, my dear friend and mentor to the Beatles, etc., uh, sat down and went through hundreds of songs and uh, narrowed them down to the songs on that album, plus seven others which have come out on a, a bla boot bootleg. Leg, uh, um, so that's how that happened. I guess the one that got the most uh, radio attention, because you can't uh, turn on a movie in black and white, or not the colorized version, but oh, you can't... Oh, as time goes by? Yeah. yeah. From, yeah. From well, Blankham. it's not the best cut, but it did get the most play, yeah. Go figure, as we say. Go figure. You had done an incredible tribute to the Beatles long before this incident where they supported you and, and your career. Well, they heard that. Derek Taylor played that for them, and John and Derek were on acid for 34 hours listening to it. You know? <laughs> what, what possessed you to do that? Or you can't you you can't do that. That's why that, that appealed to me. You can't do that. And I was saying, what do you mean? It's all like the same chords. Listen, you know. <laughs> Is that it? Yeah. So you just picked and choose. Yeah. What they that was early stuff, you know. That's right. But mixing and matching I different. Put, I think Beatles I put songs. fourteen or fifteen references on there. Let's count them. Yeah, some of them are hard to hear. There's like a like from Girl, you know, and uh, there's one that, uh, there's another one that's sort of buried, but uh, yeah, you can count them. We can make a game out of this. Yeah. How at, many references? At 92.3 K-Rock. At 92.3 K-Rock, that's You Can't Do That. Harry Nielsen from his debut album back in 1967, 25th anniversary this year. Does that... Uh, Is that right? Yeah. I thought it came out in 68 for some reason. December 67. So wow. you're, you're, you were close. December? Yeah. Ah. Late in the year. I'd like to say 68. Makes me sound younger. <laughs> <laughs> Besides, that'll make me eligible for the Hall of Fame, right? Eh? <laughs> that's right. There you go. There you go. The 25-year uh, eligibility rule. Next year rule. Um, I don't think I'll make it on the first lottery. <laughs> Beatles, Beatles, Beatles. Now you've uh, not only paid tribute to them on record, they've boosted your career, you've gotten to meet and work with them. In fact, your name is associated a great deal in the early 70s with, uh, with John Lennon. Here's a rough question for you, Harry. Were you a bad influence on John Lennon, or was John Lennon a bad influence on you? Have you ever thought about it? Sure, take your pick. Yeah. So, I mean, he was free white in 21, and so was I. And, you know, I didn't force any foul-tasting liquids down his throat. Mm -hmm. in, my, in my eyes, I'm with them, and, and you could commit murder. So I thought, well, if they drink, I can drink. Mm-hmm. You know, and they were thinking, well, Harry's this drinker. Well, we can drink. We're, you know, we'll be like Harry. You know, so, I mean, who started who or whom, I, I don't know. But it was just like like a, well, if you drink, I'll drink. Right. And whatever you do, I'll do. And that's sort of the way it was, you know. And uh, we drank. <laughs> it became Some. It became a problem in your life? It became a problem in all our lives. And what was what was the lowest point? 
Oh, I don't know. Um, I think when you get to self-pity and rejection and uh, I'm no good and nobody likes me and boo-hoo and, and you see things aren't what they really should be and you're wasting your life away, I think that's when you quit, you know. And you went through all of that at the oh, time. Oh, sure, everything from suicidal thoughts to, you know, just, you just, you feel worthless, you know, and no self-esteem, no no friends. You just, you know, well, I mean, other than your buddies that you're drinking with, and mm -hmm. they're all down, you know. We, we had great times. We'd laugh like hell, not know what we were laughing at. And the next day, somebody like Ringo would call and say, can you remember one thing we said last night that we laughed at, you know? One thing, Harry, you know, and I couldn't. Mm. Things like that, you know, and then all, all these all friends were dying. Keith Moon died, Mal Evans died, all these other people. Keith Moon died in my bed, so did Mama Cass, you know. Oh, that, oh I completely forgot about that. That was your apartment yeah. in, in England? Yeah. Sublet? Yeah. Not sublet. What a just, horror. Just giving it to him, you know, as a friend. We were going to have to get to this subject sooner or later. I guess it'll be sooner. Uh, where were you, Harry, when you heard about John? What was that night or day like for you? Well, again, uh, Ringo and I were in Nassau in the Bahamas, and uh, I had to go back to L.A. for a day to finish up a record I was making with uh, Frank Stallone, of all people. This is his only chart record, or his first chart record. Uh, we did Joni Mitchell's uh, I Could Drink a Case of You. It's a good little record. And uh, we had all the guys who played on the Lennon record and all the guys who played on Ringo's and John's and mine. So it was like old home week in the studio, you know. We are all reminiscing about John at the time. There was a break. And we're sitting there saying, remember the time this happened? Remember the time? Remember the time we had all the, the group over at the record plant with Mick Jagger and Stevie Wonder? And, and we're laughing and saying, remember the time John did the thing? And just then some guy came running in and he said, John's been shot. And everybody went, what? I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. Um, has anybody confirmed this yet, you know? And just then another guy, a kid, came running in the other side of the studio and he said, uh, uh, John Lennon's just been shot, he's dead. And it was like, what? You know, and everything just stopped for a minute. People just looked at each other and shook their heads. And I went in the bathroom and just put a wet towel on my face and just said, Jesus Christ, not him, you know? Um, came out and looked at everybody and we were just sitting around drinking we just we drank an awful lot that night and then the question was do we go on doing the session or not and we did go on we got the session done and Indian Ed Davis who is the late great Indian Ed Davis uh, he got so loaded he uh, he was crying and he left his guitar in the street and so I got his guitar and I took him to my place and the next day and then we wouldn't turn on the TV because it was just full of it you know mm. and the next day it was still on every channel and uh, finally and then he said about three in the afternoon he said something about not only that but I lost my guitar I said no I've got that you know and he says oh great you know and then we talked a little bit about it and the phone was ringing off the hook so we kept that off the hook and for about three days it was just uh you know, oh, and uh, Monday, see, we were supposed to meet with John in Manhattan. That's the part I left out. Ringo and I we were going to finish up Ringo's album. Everybody did a bit. I did a bit. Paul did a bit. George did a bit. And, and John was going to do his, his bit, which I think was called Life Begins at 40. And uh, I was supposed to go to New York. And I thought, well, <laughs> no sense now, you know. Uh, they were in New York. It was Monday. Was it Monday? It was Sunday happened night? on a Monday. Yeah, Monday. And I saw the pictures of of uh, Ringo and Barbara uh, entering the Dakota. And I thought, oh boy. So the next day he showed up in L.A. And he called me. He says, I said, I thought you were in London. He says, that's for the press. He says, I'm here. And he gave me his address, and there were guards. And you know, I went over and comforted him as best I could, and said, if I could take it from you, I would. You know, but I'm sorry. Nothing can be done. Uh, we've covered a lot of territory here today. I do want to ask you another thing, though, and maybe this relates to John, maybe not. W what turned your life around? What what put the uh, alcohol and the substances 
on the side for you and, and, and led to this more productive period. It just seemed wrong what I was doing. It just seemed wrong. Uh, I had enough money at the time and I, had, I was what you call a high bottom drunk. Uh, I had everything going for me except one thing, me, you know? And then one time I got a ticket for drunk driving and I, and the guy says, why don't you go into a rehab place? And I said, no, no, no thanks. You know, I don't join clubs. And, uh, I thought about it and I thought about it and I said, you know, maybe I should do this. It's time. Maybe it's time. So I had a real hard look at myself in the mirror and said, uh, sign me up. And I went down to a, a rehab center and, uh, Pasadena where it was nice and quiet and it wasn't a fancy joint either it was guys all tattooed and real you know rough a rough bunch and I listened to the stories and I told mine and we did the steps and said prayers together and by the time you left I mean it was like a little brotherhood you know you and you're all swearing I'm not gonna drink anymore I'm not going to and a bunch of them fell off the wagon right away but I'm staying on it uh, for today <laughs> I'm real pleased to hear that so am I thank you and I said it took 25 years for this uh, meeting to happen. It was worth the wait, Harry. I, I agree with you 100%. It's been a great joy. I hope, uh, hope this is the first of many visits. Good. I'll come back. Thanks for being with us. Thank you.